Hello everybody, welcome. Good morning. Hey, can everybody hear me? Type into the chat and let us know where you're joining us from on this lovely, wealthy, winning Wednesday. Woohoo! Who is excited? All right, I see we have people on. And all right, Alfred says yes. All right, welcome. Where are you joining us from, Alfred? Let us know. Whether you're in the snow, the rain, or the sunshine, we'd love to hear it. Elisa says hello. Hi, Elisa. And then we have Sh Shukita from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I think I butchered that name a little bit. Murfreesboro. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for joining us. We also have Irene from Colorado Springs. Welcome, Irene. And Elise, oh, you're from New York. Okay, and Alfred, you're from Modesto. Okay, that's really great. While we're waiting for a couple more people to jump on, I'm just going to introduce the books that we'll be teaching from today. This book is called Blue Ocean Strategy. And, okay, you can see the authors there. Kim uh, Chan, Kim, and Renee M Maborne. And you can find this book on Amazon. Not only is it a published book, you can also get it on Kindle, the ebook digital version, and you can get the audio book, which I love listening to the audio while I have the published book in my hand so I can underline and make notes. Let's see, Janice from New York. Hey, Janice, welcome. Ingrid from Los Angeles, woohoo! All right, we got California in the house, New York, and everywhere in between. And this is the second book we'll be talking about today. Let's see if we can see it there. The Art of Innovation by Tom Kelly. Now, Tom Kelly and his brother, they actually founded a company called IDEO, IDEO and what they do is creative design for businesses. So they share a lot of tips in here so I do recommend get this book we'll also be going over more tips from this book later in these sessions so who's ready to get started okay let's get our slideshow going here and today's topic is blue ocean strategy be the boss and dominate your market who's excited who wants to be the boss of their market Better yet, who wants to eliminate the competition and make the competition irrelevant? We're going to show you how real estate brokerages can innovate, differentiate, and capture unique market share with Blue Ocean Strategy success. And you'll see there's a little R behind the Blue Ocean Strategy because it is a copyrighted term from the um, authors of the book. And I actually went through the training and got certified to be able to teach this to you. So I'll be talking more about that today as well. So let's keep going here. Welcome to your future. As a matter of fact, your future is so bright you have to wear shades. So in today's presentation, first we're going to go over innovation in real estate. Then we'll talk about the Blue Ocean Strategy Success Concept, which I've abbreviated, I call it BOSS. And then we'll compare Blue Ocean to Red Ocean. And I'll give you some real life stories of businesses and then we'll look at some brokerage case studies. Okay, ready to get started? Let's keep going here. Now, how many of us know the real estate industry is competitive? It's super competitive because there are so many agents and so many brokers and that makes it a little tough for us working in the industry every day because we have so much competition, right? Well, when I first got my real estate license, I went to work for a top selling real estate agent at a brokerage and I thought she was awesome, but not everybody in her office felt the same way because 
most likely they were jealous because she was a top producer. So I, I did her bookkeeping. I ran the property management office. I did the, um, you know, the day to day things of running her office, paying the bills. And one day she came to me and she handed me a bill and it was for $500 and it was a fine from our realtor association. And I said, what is that? She said, well, it's a, a fine that I have to pay because I got uh, somebody reported me as my listing didn't comply with their rules. I said, somebody reported you. That's kind of weird. Like, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, who goes around reporting people? <laughs> and she said, well, it was somebody in our office. And for me, being new to the real estate industry, my thought was, well, aren't your friends in your office? Aren't they your colleagues? If they see something wrong with your ad, why wouldn't they just pick up the phone and call you and say, hey, there's something wrong with your ad. You might want to fix it. Why would they instead go turn me in and file a complaint and make sure that I got a fine? So I did not understand that reasoning. I didn't understand the competitiveness and it, it took me by surprise a little bit. And I started calling it shark eat shark. And by the way, this was not the first time somebody in her office had tried to turn her in for something and make sure that she got fined. So I call this, shark eat shark industry how many of us are familiar with that oh elisa you said the sound is dropping out okay if your sound is not all there um it could be on your end as well so tr you can try logging off and then logging back on again okay so in the real estate industry it's a very tough competitive market how many would agree with that? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, reconnect. Okay, awesome. So a little bit about me. I think most of you already know me by now, but I got my BA or my BA degree in real estate a few years ago. And then right after that went on into my MBA degree. I've had my real estate license since 1988. So that's 31 years. And I own a small boutique real estate brokerage. I also teach at the college, teach real estate classes and real estate licensing classes. And most importantly, I consult with brokerage owners. My passion and my mission is to elevate the standards of real estate in our industry and, and make sure that we're all learning, growing, developing our companies, and most importantly, Staying profitable, right? Maximizing profitability. That's our goal. This is my certificate of completion from Blue Ocean Academy, where I took the Blue Ocean 101 series of courses to be able to get certified and to teach this class here to you today. So as you know, we have previously had uh, master class sessions on building your brokerage empire and we had 12 sessions of that and that ended a couple of weeks ago and now we're starting a brand new series this series is called blue ocean strategy series we're going to have eight sessions and today is the first of eight sessions so our session is going to be sort of an introduction to get you started thinking about your business model and I will introduce you to the Blue Ocean Strategy concept and show you some examples that should really get your mind thinking about opportunities and about the direction for your business. And in week number two, we'll go over the analytical tools and frameworks. In number three, we're going to reconstruct market boundaries. In number four, we'll focus on the big picture. In number five, we'll reach beyond existing demand. Number six, we'll get the strategic se sequence just right. Number seven, we'll overcome key organizational hurdles. And then session number eight is building execution into your strategy. Because all this we're learning means nothing if we don't go out and execute and take action, right? 
So how many of us have watched the movie, The Titanic, right? Probably all of us. And we know the story about the Titanic. Why did it sink? My theory is it sunk because the captain underestimated the icebergs under the water. Yes, they saw the icebergs on top of the water, but they thought their ship was so strong that they didn't realize the scope and the strength of the icebergs under the water. And that's sort of like us with our real estate brokerage. Market disruption is coming. We see a little bit of it. We might see a third party website and get upset about their value estimates that they give to homeowners because they're not correct. Uh, or we might feel like those big discount brokerages are maybe going to take over and um, we're going to be left with no market share. And those are only what we can see above the water. And that makes me wonder, hmm, what icebergs are hiding under the water? Is your brokerage prepared for the market disruption that's coming that you know about and that you don't know about? What about another recession or should I say depression like we had 10 years ago? Is your brokerage ready to withstand that? What about market disaster and ultimate competition? So there's a lot of things that are constantly changing in our market and there are some changes headed our way. We don't know what fully what they are or what their impact will be, but we do know that we need to be ready no matter what the market holds. So with that, we have a little poll for you. And our question is, do you think a market downturn is coming? So let's get that poll up. Do you think a market downturn is coming? And your answer would be either A, yes, within the next year, B, probably so, but I don't know when. I can't predict it, I don't have a crystal ball, but I know it's out there somewhere. Number C is no, real estate will always keep going up, and I don't think there will ever be a market downturn in this economy. All right, so we got some great answers already. We have 33% saying yes, that a market downturn is coming within the next year. 67% saying probably, oh, that changed again. 50% said yes within the next year. And 50% has said probably, I don't know when. So if you have any more answers, go ahead and participate now. We're going to end the poll in just a minute. I think the whole point of this is that, yes, we need to be ready because real estate will not always keep going up indefinitely. It is a cycle. It's a seasonal cycle as well as a market cycle subject to the economics of our local economy, statewide economy, national economy, and ultimately the global economy. So those of us who have remembered from our real estate economics class, we know that it's a cycle that, you know, does repeat itself. All right, so that poll is ended. We got 50-50 on A and B. Good job, everyone. Our job as real estate brokerage owners is to innovate and lead the industry. We don't want to get stuck in the sand when the economy changes, and we know it is going to. So it's great if our business is doing good now, but hopefully we're looking forward to the future. We have our, um, you know, glasses on and our, our telescope or whatever it is to look forward to the future and realize that something is coming down the road and we may not be able to identify it right now, but we know that we need to be ready. And preparation is half the key to this battle, right? So what are the advantages of innovation? Well, it's important to recognize trends in the market before they arrive and master the innovation process. 
we're going to be filling a need that has been previously unidentified in our market. And when you are able to recognize what the market needs and fill that need before your competitors do, you're automatically going to take a leadership position because you have differentiated products. And now instead of you following and copying other companies, they'll be following and copying you. So blue ocean strategy is great because you're going to jump out there ahead of your competitors, do something new and innovative that they're not doing. But you can be sure that if you're successful, they will be right on your heels and you're going to have to, you know, pedal hard to stay ahead. So that is the important thing is to stay ahead of the market changes. Now from this book here called The Art of Innovation by Tom Kelly, it, it's a really eye-opening book. It has nothing to do with real estate whatsoever, and that's why I recommend you read it so that you can get some great ideas and start thinking about innovation from a different mindset other than what you've always known and always done in real estate. One of the key concepts that he discusses in this book is about the type of economy we're in. Because really when we're talking about innovation, we're not, we don't sit in a corner and invent tech products. When we talk about innovation, what we're really doing is we're looking at the market need and we're creating something that adapts to what the market needs. So the commodity economy, if we can remember, you know, back to the 40s and 50s, when somebody was having a birthday, mom would buy all the ingredients, the flour, the sugar, and salt, mix it all together, the baking powder, and she would bake a cake from scratch. So that was the commodity economy. Next, <clears throat> excuse me, we had the product economy. And that is where mom buys the cake mix. And that's where you can go into the store. You see the Betty Crocker cake mix. So mom said, this is too much work to do everything from scratch. I'm just going to buy the cake mix and put a little milk or water or oil in and then bake it. Obviously, I know it goes into it. I've done a few of these. <laughs> when our kids were young, we had lots of birthdays. And next, what evolved after that is the service economy. And that's where mom is working at another job full time outside the home. She's super busy and she, she doesn't even have time to buy the cake mix and bake it from scratch. So she just calls the bakery has them make the cake and they put your name on it and she brings it home. It's ready to go with the candles, right? And then we have the last one, which is the economy we're in now. This is the experience economy. Everybody wants to have a great experience. If you think about Amazon or Starbucks or Zappos or all of those types of companies that are experiencing rapid growth and popularity, it's because they don't just give you a product or serve you something, but it's an entire experience. So in this example with the birthday cake, think of going to Chuck E. Cheese where everybody has a party, they have fun, Chuck E. Cheese supplies the games, the toys, the prizes, and then they have the cake at the very end. So think of that a little bit. How can that relate to real estate? Well, some of us say in real estate, oh, well, we sell houses or we help you buy a house. Or, you know, that's the product economy, right? Or the service economy is, oh, we're going to connect you with some sources. And now we'll put all the pieces together for you. Well, now in today's economy, people want more. They don't just want a product or service. They want an experience. Okay, so I'm not going to give you an example of an experience in real estate because I want your mind to start thinking about how can you offer somebody, a potential buyer or seller or investor, a complete experience that's not necessarily just a one transaction 
buy a house for me. Okay, go away until you're ready to sell it in seven years from now. Okay, so think about how you can offer or roll out a red carpet experience. That is more of what people are looking for than just a product or service. Now, as you're going to be thinking about that today, we're going to circle back at the very end because we're going to talk about this and we have some case studies and one of them I'm going to present is going to be a new innovative idea about an experience economy. But I want you to start thinking about it a little bit now. Okay, everybody good? What about your business model? Do you have a traditional business model? And then we see here what the world's best boss from the office, right? Or do you have an innovative business model? What is the culture at your company? Are you stuck in the past of this is the way we've always done it? Or are you willing to innovate, think outside the box of new ways of doing business that, that haven't been done before, but that your customers are asking for and demanding? So what are these barriers to implementing innovation? Well, of course, there are geographic barriers, national barriers, culture, influence. All of those things could be reasons why we tell ourselves we're not innovative. Nobody else is doing it or it won't work here or for this reason, people won't accept our innovation. But I'll tell you the biggest barrier to innovation is right here, right in our mind. It's our mindset. How many times have you heard someone say, that's how we've always done it. They're resistant to change and you can't blame them for that. That's just human nature is that we, we don't like change. We we're comfortable with what's familiar, but to move to the next level, we need to be become comfortable with being uncomfortable. In other words, we have to get into a process of continuous innovation and change. So what's inhibiting your creative zone? The average person has between 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts going through their mind every day. And you'd say, wow, that's a lot, which it is. That's a lot of thoughts to be constantly going through your mind. But actually of those thoughts, 95% of them are the same repetitive thoughts as yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before. So even though there's a lot of thoughts going through our minds, it's not necessarily anything new, different change or innovative. And as a matter of fact, 80% of those thoughts are negative. Now, Albert Einstein said, we can't solve problems using the same kind of thinking that created them. So in order to get your mind into a place where you're truly innovative, you really have to stop thinking about what you've always done and be willing to do something that you've never done before. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to put our creative caps on. We're going to think outside the box just for the next you know, 30 minutes. And we're not going to think of traditional real estate the way we've always done it. So today I'm really not going to give you a lot of solutions as much as I am going to help you start your mind thinking about the creative process that we need to get to the next level. So now we have a poll. What are you seeking to innovate? Are you trying to start up a new brokerage? Do you want to revamp your existing brokerage? Or is it something else not related to real estate brokerages at all, which is perfectly fine? Because a lot of times we hear these innovative concepts and it gets us thinking about a lot of things, maybe in our home life or a nonprofit organization we work with in our community or perhaps um, just something that we have a personal goal for and we don't, we've been stuck and didn't know how to reach it. So when you're thinking of innovation, we're going to get unstuck 
and we're going to start with a fresh clean slate okay did everybody already answer the poll what are you seeking to innovate a start up a new brokerage b revamp your existing brokerage or c is something else none of the above so far we have 100 percent is revamp your existing brokerage which is good you're in the right spot Woohoo! all righty we're gonna keep going so meet blue ocean strategy what is blue ocean strategy okay as i mentioned from my book here it's called how to create uncontested market space and make the competition irrelevant and this book is a book that i read in my master's program i actually also watched a video we explored the concept and learned about it in one of my entrepreneurship classes it, it was life-changing and mind-blowing for me and i thought if i could learn so much about completely um, a complete new business strategy and get these revelations and insights and this wisdom certainly i can share that with all of my broker friends and they can learn as well so that's why i created this blue ocean strategy series what blue ocean is it's profitability without competition that seems like a dream come true doesn't it so there are basically four parts to this the first is lowering your operational costs now, I didn't say lowering your price to the end customer. I said lowering your operational costs internally so you maximize the profit value, your profitability. And number two is raising customer value. So in addition to reducing your internal price, you're going to raise the value of what you're offering to the customer so they see more value and are willing to pay an even higher price. Number three is you're going to offer innovative services based on customer demand. And we'll, we'll go through that here today. And lastly, we're going to find new non-customers. And that is just a mind-blowing concept to most of us in real estate because we've always been taught, okay, get people who are pre-qualified and you know put them through your buyer funnel. Find sellers who are already FISBO or expired because we know they want to sell and put them through your listing funnel. Well, what about going and finding new non-customers? And I'm not talking just about buyers and sellers, but also about agents. Because with most of us as brokerage owners, who are, where do we get our agents from? Okay, well, I admit it. We go to the our nearest competitor and just steal their good agents. But with the blue ocean strategy we're going to reach out into your sphere of influence into your untapped market potential and find people who have not even thought about becoming a real estate agent and bring them into your company and that's how we're going to find new non-customers instead of just recycling the same old customers as our competitors so let's get on our yacht and sail away to the island to the blue ocean where there's no competition. Now let's talk about what Blue Ocean Strategy is not. It is not competing head to head with other brokerages. It's not chasing the hottest new trend in technology, and it's not about being cheaper or lower priced than competitors. As some people say, well, innovation is just disruption. And that's a myth. It's not necessarily disruption per se. Okay, so when you're competing head to head with other brokerages, like most of us are doing, that's not Blue Ocean strategy. As a matter of fact, it's a Red Ocean strategy. Here's our brokerage. Here's the brokerage next door to us. We're shooting cannons at each other. What happens after a while? People fall off the boat, we're bleeding and dying, and the sharks come out, and the ocean turns bloody red. And that's the blue ocean. And 
Is there, uh, I'm sorry, that's the red ocean. And is there a red ocean in the real estate industry? You bet. Probably 95% or more of real estate brokerages are competing in this blue, in the red ocean. Now it has nothing to do with the prices and services you offer. What you're doing is you're competing for the same customers. And that is the key concept of the red ocean strategy is that there is so much competition that you're all competing with each other. So red ocean strategy is competing to be the best, competing on price, competing on service. So for example, if you're competing on price and you go to a listing appointment, you say, hey, we offer this amount of brokerage uh, commission. And then the competitor next door, they go and they talk to those homeowners and say, hey, we're going to offer 1% less. And then the next one says, oh, we're offering 1% less. And, you know, it just gets lower and lower because you're all just competing on price, but you're offering the same service. So why wouldn't it matter to a customer if everybody's offering the same service? So Red Ocean strategy is also trying to be faster, better, or cheaper so in other words, doing the same thing, but doing it a little bit better or trying to do it faster than your competitors, or it's even copying competitors. Let's face it, that's what almost everybody does in the real estate industry is we copy each other. Red Ocean strategy is also growth by acquisition of competitors. So if you go and acquire a competitor, you haven't really grown and that's definitely not Blue Ocean strategy that we're talking about today. So I think we need to cue up the Jaws music, right? Da, 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 da. Now we got the red ocean with the shark circling about to take a bite. So now let's talk about our competitors. Who are your competitors? Are your competitors A, local franchises and indie brokerages? Or do you think your primary competitors are giant corporations who have tons of capital who are going to wipe out all the mom and pop shops one day? Or do you think you have no competitors because you're so unique and you're doing something special that you really have no competitors? So everybody, uh, go ahead and take a stab at this poll, who you think your competitors are. A is local franchises. B is indie brokerages, and C, we have none because we're unique. All right, we got a B answer coming in. Giant corporations with capital. And by the way, you've noticed I haven't named any brokerages, any brands, any third-party sites or giant corporations. And that's not the purpose of this um, session. So I won't be naming any companies and you can sort of fill in the blank of what companies you see in your market that you think may be taking market share from you either now or in the future. Okay, it looks like everybody is, oh, we got some answers for A as well. All right, we got split between A and B, local franchises and indie brokers, in other words, your neighborhood or giant corporations with capital, in other words, those who seemingly have an endless supply of millions or billions of dollars, they're just using to fuel their company regardless of if they have a profit and their goal apparently appears to be just grow very big, very fast and uh, with endless uh, capital and resources coming in. That Of course, we mom and pop shops and small brokerages, we don't have access to all of that capital, right? So we can't compete with them. Now I want to talk just for a minute about answer number C. We have no competitors because we're unique. And there's two things going on if you think you're so unique you have no competitors. Um, first of all, maybe you really truly are a blue ocean and you don't have any competitors because you jumped out there, you, you're innovative, and you've been able to capture a unique market share before others have figured that out. Or more likely than not, um, you probably do have competitors and you're not aware of who they are. Or maybe you think that, that you offer really great service. 
So if you think you have no competitors, ask yourself this question. If my customer didn't come to me, where else would they go? And that's your competitor. That's your competition. So if, for example, if an agent came to work with you, but if your company didn't exist, they would have went to work with a brokerage down the street, then that is your competition. Same thing with sellers. If the seller didn't list with you, they surely would have listed with somebody. Who would have they who would they have listed with? And that company is your competitor. Okay, great. We have 25% are saying local franchises and indie brokerages. And 75% giant corporations with capital. So that really tells us something. There's a lot of companies on the horizon that we need to be watching out for. And with that, we're going to go ahead and end the poll. To cross the ocean, you must have courage to lose sight of the shore. Just a little inspiration for you today. Yes, that is tough. It's tough to venture out there into the unknown. The red ocean, even though it's competitive and it's shark eat shark, it's familiar. So we're comfortable with it. It's where all of our colleagues are. It's where all of our competitors are. We know this playing field. We can excel in this playing field, in this arena. But to really innovate, to sail far away, we have to, have to lose sight of the shore. We have to draw a new map that maybe we don't know where we're going. Maybe it's a little um, fearful because we're in unfamiliar territory. And that takes a lot of courage and faith to go out there. But do it anyway. Woohoo! <laughs> now let's talk about the goal of every brokerage. Our goal, we only have one goal, one main goal, and that is to maximize our profit margin. Yes, of course, we want to offer good service and provide value to our customers and, and clients and the community and our agents. But honestly, if we're not making a profit, we can't keep our doors open to offer that service, can we? So to maximize profit margin, there are two things that we need to do. One is to lower our, our operational costs. And two is to increase our profitability or increase revenue. So let's look at an income statement sample. And I have a little disclaimer here before I show this to you. This is just a complete sample I made up. It's fictitious. It's, it's nobody's, no particular brokerage company numbers in here. It's just for the point of education and learning. Now, before you start to analyze your finances, I would refer you to your CPA, your accountant, your tax preparer, or your financial advisor regarding your specific situation. Okay, I hope everybody can see this. I know the um, letters are a little small in this, but it, this is a sample income statement of a brokerage. And here we have um, sales, which is our revenue streams coming in. And we, it's in this one, we had $1 million of revenue coming in. And that included sales transactions, referral fees, property management, agent fees, such as desk fees and things like that, transaction management fees, consulting fees, BPO fees, and all of those came into our brokerage. Now let's say that on pretty much across the board on everything, we do a 90-10 split with our agents. In other words, the brokerage retains 10% and they send 90% back to the agent. Um, and I know this is just, you know, I've oversimplified it, but just for the purposes of, um, you know, education. So if we did that, then 90% of our fees of our revenue went out the door in cost of sales. So that includes co-op buyer brokers, agent splits, referral fees, TC fees, all of those things. And that leads to a gross margin of $100,000, which is 10%. Now, do you think that's a high number or a low number? You can go ahead and comment in the um, comment in the chat bar if you think 10% gross margin is high or low for real estate brokerage. 
And while you're doing that, I'm going to next, let's go over what comes out of the gross margin is our operating expenses. That's our fixed costs and our overhead. So in that, we have our manager salary and benefits, staff salary and benefits, the building lease or the mortgage, your equipment lease, utilities, maintenance, your marketing for recruitment, your training for retention, tech tools, office supplies, your insurance, professional fees, and then your risk management. And all of that in this example, we said was $65,000 for the year. So that's 6.5%. And our net profit or EBITDA, which is uh, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, is only $35,000, and that is a 3.5% net profit margin. Annalisa commented, said that's too low. Shakita said that's low. You're both right. That is a very low gross margin. Um, so that's something to be aware of is our variable expenses. In this case, we did cost of sale, which is, you know, for example, your agent um, has a listing, you earn $10,000 for the brokerage, but of that 10,000, you pay 9,000 to your agent as a 90% split and you keep 10,000 and that leaves you very little for your, um, to contribute to the gross margin which then has to go on to pay your operating expenses and overhead, right? And by the way, the numbers I'm using here have nothing to do with any particular brokerage. We're just crunching numbers as an example to help you understand a brokerage income statement. Okay. All right, now let's move on and talk about innovation designed intentionally. Now we know that we need to, as shown in this slide, we need to lower the cost of sales, which is our variable expenses. We need to lower our operating expenses, which is our fixed costs. And we need to raise our gross margin and raise our net profit. So keep that in your mind. We're going to go on to innovation and we're going to look at how through innovation we can accomplish these goals that come back and affect our income statement. Okay. So, Innovation designed intentionally. Now, some people think when you see a creative idea or a creative person or, for example, in this book called The Art of Innovation, which, by the way, is a fabulous audible read, The Art of Innovation by Tom Kelly. When you see the ideas in there, you, you think, oh, wow, that's those are creative people. That's magic. It just happens overnight these creative people they go to bed at night they wake up in the morning and voila like magic they have all these creative ideas and that's why they're successful but it's actually quite the opposite because innovation does not just randomly happen there's a process to it it's an art it's something that each of us can do and we can learn the steps to be creative and to innovate. And that's why I do recommend the book, The Art of Innovation, because they really go through different steps that you can take to start thinking with a more innovative mindset instead of just assuming it randomly happens, right? So we're going to create something new in the market, and it's going to be a series of steps, a process that we go through. So now let's apply that to the red ocean versus a blue ocean strategy. So what is the red ocean strategy? As we said before, they're competing in the existing market space with everybody else, all the other competitors, whereas blue ocean strategy, you're creating your own uncontested market space. You're finding new buyers, new sellers, new agents that they didn't think of before. In Red Ocean Strategy, we're trying to beat the competition by beating them on price or service or being faster or better than them. And in Blue Ocean Strategy, we don't care about the competition. They're irrelevant because we're doing something completely different they're not doing. In Red Ocean Strategy, we're trying to ex exploit the existing demand and everybody's fighting for that same piece of that pie, that same share of the pie. 
And there's only so much pie to go around between the brokerages. But in Blue Ocean Strategy, we don't care about that pie. They can have their pie. We've gone out and we've created a whole new pie. In Red Ocean Strategy, brokerages have to make the value cost trade-off. So in other words, they have to sacrifice value in order to lower their costs, right? But in Blue Ocean Strategy, we're not doing that. We're going to offer more value to our customers while simultaneously lowering our costs. So in Red Ocean Strategy, the point is the whole system of the firm's activity is aligned with strategic choice of differentiation or low cost. So in other words, are you going to be different or are you going to lower your costs? Whereas in Blue Ocean Strategy, the whole firm's activities are pursuing both differentiation and lower cost simultaneously. So you have an activity worksheet. Let me share that with you now. It's called Boss Workbook number one let me know if you can if you can get the workbook the sections in the workbook is why innovate what we've already talked about red ocean versus blue ocean what we just now shared with you and then we have the value innovation equation which we're going to be going over in just a minute and then the activity which is called shark fishing is for you to do on your own after today's session so to help illustrate the point of blue ocean versus red ocean. We have a few examples here. So we have Cirque de Soleil, which is worlds away. And this is something that they created from scratch that has nothing to do with a circus or has nothing to do with the theater. It's sort of a hybrid of both of those, but they created an entirely new market. If you were to ask somebody, oh, is this a circus or is it a theater? They would probably be puzzled and say, well, neither, which is true. So what they did is my little whiteboard drawing on here. So they actually looked at different features such as price. Right. And what happened to the price at the Ringling Brothers? Ringling Brothers, their price is down here, it's low. What about when you go to Cirque de Soleil? Their price is up here, it's high. They changed the pricing structure. They also changed star performers. Star performers were really, are really important in Ringling Brothers, but in Cirque de Soleil, they're not important. And um, so you can see that they are down here in the blue ocean also what else is not important the animal shows the aisle concessions the multiple show arenas they eliminated all of that because they said customers really didn't want that but what do they want they want the fun and the humor and they want thrills and danger and so they kept those and then they created something new they raised a brand new venue and they created artistic music and dance. And those are things that had never been seen before in the industry. So that's a great example of Blue Ocean Strategy. Let's go on to the next one, which is, okay, this one is the we. Now, who is the we targeting? Who is their main audience? We saw in the Cirque de Soleil, their main audience was not children, as in the Ringling Brothers Circus, their main audience is an adults who want to go to the, a theater-like performance and they're willing to pay more. Same thing with the Wii. They're not targeting 14-year-old boys who want to sit there and, and play video games, shoot them up video games. They're targeting families, adults, something they can all do together. And therefore, the price level is higher. People are willing to pay more for it. And it's something new and complex that nobody has thought about before is this market with parents and children playing games together in their living room, right? So they created a whole new market. Same thing with Southwest. When they created their market, I mean, here's the ocean of, you know, the high-end um, airlines. 
lounges are important, seating choices, friendly service, and all of that. But when Southwest created their company, they decided lounges weren't important. We're going to eliminate those. Seating choices aren't important. Hub connectivity is not important. Consumers don't care about that. We eliminated that. Instead, we're going to offer super friendly service, super fast, and they actually created a new market because now they compete with, instead of competing with other airlines, they compete with trains, buses, and cars. So if you look at what Southwest did when they first started, they don't do as much anymore because they do nationwide flights, but they were very short flights, you know, less than an hour flights within the same market, and they were trying to capture the market of people who didn't want to drive or take a train or whatever there. I hope everybody's understanding a little more about the blue ocean strategy. Let's keep going here on your workbook on page three, I believe it is, you're going to see the value innovation equation. And in that, this is what we've been talking about to get to the blue ocean. The first thing you're going to want to do is to reduce your costs and cost savings are made by eliminating and reducing factors an industry competes on. And we just saw three examples where these innovative companies eliminated things that customers really didn't care about, but all the competitors seemed to offer anyway. They just eliminated those. And then they raised the buyer value or their customer value, and this we call it buyer value, but it's the same as customer value, by raising and creating elements the industry never offered before, there was a customer demand that was untapped. And when you put both of those together, that's where you come up with a blue diamond in the middle. That's our value innovation, a new market that's created and previous non-buyers are reached. Let's look at Airbnb. Let's look at Lyft and Uber and all of those. What did they do? They found a need in the market that people really wanted, but people didn't even know they wanted that need, that they had that need and they tapped into that and they were able to build an innovative business model. Here's my last example from outside the real estate industry, Smile Direct Club. They compete with people who, uh, people who wanna go to the dentist and get braces, or maybe not. Maybe they found their own competitive market of people who don't wanna go to the dentist, people who can't afford to pay $10,000, and people don't want to have ugly metal things on their teeth for two or three years. So they have something completely innovative. It's a plastic design that just clicks into the teeth. It just pops right in and straightens your teeth. And um, very, very innovative design. And their cost is maybe $2,000 compared to $10,000. And they now have you know hundreds and thousands of customers because they've tapped into a market need with an innovative idea. All right, now we're gonna go into some case studies with some um, real estate brokerages. Now, I have a little disclaimer before I talk about these brokerages. These are not real brokerages. These are fictitious, imaginary things that I thought of for myself as I was looking at business models and creating my business model uh, about 10 years ago. So. Again, these are, and we're not naming any companies or any brokerages or anything, okay? So in this one, it's the buyer rebate brokerage. The first, the business model is to give 100% rebate to the buyers in exchange for a hope of a listing later on. That's a great way to get buyers, right? They get 100% rebate, but it's not really blue ocean because we're still competing on price. Maybe we add it additional value, but it didn't lower our internal costs. As a matter of fact, it raised our costs because we still have to pay our overhead with no funds coming in right now, you know, maybe in the future, but there's no guarantee of profit profitability ever in this business model. The other problem is it doesn't align with the industry design. So for example, it's relying on the other brokerages who are giving a co-op commission to your um, to the buyer's broker, which not all of them do that. And in some states that is even actually illegal. So 
This is a red ocean strategy. Now let's look at this, the next one called Beach Homes Realty. This is a blue ocean strategy. In this company, they have sought out a new type of customer, which are buyers, baby boomers, who are retiring, who want to move somewhere where there's water. So their focus is waterfront properties. And, you know, I'm in California, so we call this Beach Homes Realty. But it, it's not limited to one particular state, right? So we could create additional value by finding and showing them all the, the waterfront properties. We've identified a new customer niche and we're lowering our operational costs because we're being able to outsource, do referrals, and work from you know a small office, have a small footprint. And there's basically no competition for this, right? So that's another idea. Now let's look at another red ocean strategy. And this one I call short sell realty. Now we saw a lot of these back in the day, 10 years ago, when we were doing a lot of short sales, um, is that all of us broker just had to do short sales to stay alive. It was basically what the market was filled with. So I thought, why not double in a short sale listing? Because you know we're getting paid so little for these. A lot of times the banks will cut the commission and it's a lot of work. You could stay with the same client for a year to two years and maybe still not even close. So um, that's not really a blue ocean strategy, though. As a matter of fact, it's a red ocean because you're attempting to compete with competitors and lock them out. It really didn't lower any operational costs and it didn't create additional value. And we're working harder to be we have to have more quantity just to be profitable because we know with a lot of the short sell listings, the bank is already cutting the commission on those. Right. That they're approving for the brokerages. Um, it also depends on cooperation from the big banks and it's only successful in certain types of down markets. So when the market changes, you know, your business poof, it evaporates. The other problem with this, the huge problem with this business model is that it could be unethical conduct and a lack of fiduciary duty to our seller if we're trying to double end all of our short sales. And that means we might be turning away other buyers from other brokerages, which is not something that, that we want to do that might cross not just the ethical line, but also the legal line as well. So that's a no go. Now let's look at renovation realty and this company that um, what I found is that a lot of sellers, they want to sell their house for top dollar, but their house is not in top condition. They've lived in it for 10 years or 20 years and it's run down, it's outdated or it needs repairs and they don't have money to do that. And I found that with a lot of um, sellers, especially probate, estate sales, um, people who have owned for a long time. And that's a great market. So what can you do? You know, maybe as a brokerage owner, the broker can partner with a finance company to be able to help them renovate their house before selling it. The broker takes on all those costs and then gets paid at close of escrow. It's sort of like those shows you see on HGTV where it's the before and after. And what have you done there? You've created additional value for your seller. You lower operational costs because you're going to be outsourcing the financing portion to a financing company. And you've identified a new customer niche of people who otherwise might not have sold their house because they didn't think they had any value in it or because they didn't have enough equity or they didn't have money to go through the process of bringing it up to uh, today's, um, you know, aesthetic standards. So this could be successful again with estate sales, probate, FISBOs, absentee owners, rental property, all of these things. And that's an example of blue ocean strategy. Now we have an example, another example of red ocean strategy. We're going to call this big city REO brokers. And I know 10 years ago, that was a hot trend to acquire REO listings, to become an REO uh, brokerage of choice, 
to have lots of REO accounts and work with the asset managers. And in a down market where you look around, it seems to be nothing but REOs and short sales, you know, that might have been good. Um, but the problem is when they dole them out to the brokerages or the agents, they can cut the commission just about as low as they like because they know everybody wants these. So that's very red ocean. It didn't lower your operational costs. As a matter of fact, your operational costs might have gone up because a lot of these uh, REO accounts, they require you to front your own money, your capital, to clean up the property, to evict tenants, to do a lot of things on your own dime and then submit for reimbursement. And they may or may not reimburse you depending on if you meet their criteria for reimbursement. So that is a very, oh, Irene says they take a lot of time too. Yes, REO properties take a lot of time and the successful brokerages that I know that handle a lot of REO accounts, they have to pay for staff. <clears throat> Excuse me, they don't have agents who are on commission. Most of them have to pay them on a salary or hourly. And then guess what happens if your accounts fluctuate and your accounts go down, all of a sudden you're letting those people go. Okay, Jenna says no audio. You might try logging off and logging in again. Let me put that in here. If you can't hear, I logging in again. Okay. Okay, so again, the REO brokers is not a blue ocean strategy. It's red ocean. You're working harder and you need more quantity to be profitable. Okay. Okay, you can hear me now. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so Definitely you don't create additional value and the bad part about the being an REO broker is it's only successful in a certain type of market and when the market shifts, then all of a sudden you're left with all this overhead, all these people you're paying on staff and salary and now you, you know, you need to be able to transition to a different type of market. So let's talk about another blue ocean. Uh, my last one and this is, um, <laughs> REO broker Janice. <laughs> um, let's talk about a subscription model. Now at the very beginning, I showed you this book, The Art of Innovation with Tom Kelly. And we discussed the different types of economies that people really don't want an economy based on price or on service anymore. Now they're looking at an experience economy. What is an experience that you can bring that's not just transaction based? Now, this is something that I'm looking at seriously is getting out of the mindset of transaction based business and getting into a year round lifetime business cycle with these clients. And so this is something that I thought of called the subscription model. In this subscription model, homeowners would pay you monthly fees or annual fees, you know, every year or every month for a lifetime. And in exchange, you offer them a value package of home related services. For example, maybe you offer them um, a home warranty package, right? With your related company that, or even your own company. Maybe you offer them uh, different other things that come with owning a house like maintenance or, you know, different things that people need as they're maintaining their house throughout the years. What is one thing that people always want that their real estate agents never give them? I wouldn't say never, but rarely. They want to know how much their house is worth. That's why people go to these third party sites in droves. That's why there's millions of them looking at these third party sites. They all want to know how much is my house worth? Did it go up in value? Did it go down in value? How much equity do I have? So couldn't you as a real estate brokerage owner, couldn't you have a service? where you every single month you send a home valuation to these clients and you let them know not just from a third party site, but from you, the actual broker who's in the market day in and day out, looking at the MLS, going into houses, seeing what's on the market, working with clients, you know what their house is worth. Couldn't you offer them a service where you supplied that to them every month? What about if you incorporated for free 
that they could sell their house either at low cost or no cost through you? And would they be willing to pay a fee year round, year after year? And would that be worth it? So that's just something to start your creative juices thinking. And Janice, who said, what are the risks of this model? Um, well, you really have to crunch the numbers and make sure that you're charging enough to cover your costs at the time when the house does sell, when they sell their house. And that would involve looking at how long the average person holds their house before they sell it and things like that. Do they hold it for, you know, three years, five years, seven years? What is your market? So anyway, this is just to get your, you, you start thinking of the mindset of thinking outside the box of traditional real estate sales. Now, why is this a blue ocean strategy? It creates additional value for your customers. You're giving them not just the sale, but you're giving them things that they need every month, every year to be a homeowner and keep their house in good condition. Things that they care about and the, the knowledge in the market, right? Tax tips, legal tips, tax tips from your tax partner, legal tips from your attorney. It would lower your operational costs if you set it up correctly and identify a brand new customer niche and you could have no competition for many years until others catch on to what you're doing and don't worry, you'll be way down the road before they figure that out. The bottom line is what hidden icebergs lurk below the surface that we don't know. Change is coming. There are going to be icebergs. We're in the Titanic. The bottom line is going to be, are you going to be ready when the changes come and when the Titanic when your boat hits those icebergs. So in summary, we talked about innovation in real estate, the blue ocean strategy concept, blue ocean versus red ocean. And we went over some very interesting case studies to start you thinking. Now today's topic came from the blue ocean strategy book, chapter one and the art of innovation. And we'll be going over both of these books more and some other really great books coming up in the next few weeks. So any questions? Okay, Irene does have a question. Over time paying monthly fees, it could add up to what might be my higher fee without it. And you're talking about the uh, subscription model, which is the Blue Ocean strategy. Yes, absolutely. You have to crunch your numbers very carefully. But yes, that, that could be something that could be even more profitable. And it could sustain your brokerage year round as well, you know, regardless of the seasons and things. Okay, there's my contact information. You're welcome to reach out at any time. Um, thank you, everybody. Before we finish up, I do want to share with you an offer. Now we had, we had a 12 course series that we just ended. And that 12 course series, now that we have all 12 courses, plus we have additional material in there, they each have workbooks, they each have handouts and bonus material and resources and, and links and, and books and all of that. All of that is included. The normal price is $99 per course. So that's 99 times, also that's $1,188. Our value price is $590, but today we do have a special. And our special is $295 for all 12 courses. Plus, we are constantly adding more videos, more training, more information. We're going to be adding interviews and all kinds of cool things to that. So if you're, if you're thinking about getting some uh, guidance, to build your brokerage empire, there you go. That is 50% off today only. Well, we'll keep it up till the end of February, $295, but uh, regular price $590, so it's half price. Awesome offer today. And Elisa says, thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Any more questions? We're going to take questions on the chat. If there are any more questions, please let us know. Any questions about brokerage or Blue Ocean Strategy, innovation, or any questions about our 12-course bundle 
which is our special half price off today, $295, which is half off of the $590 price. Woohoo! Okay, Elisa says a lot of info for thought. Yes, that's the whole point of today. That's why we really don't give you any solutions, but we want you to start thinking. And now that your mind is starting to think about innovation, you're going to be aware of it wherever you go. You're going to look in places other than real estate and see what other companies are doing. You're going to see needs in the marketplace that you hadn't seen before now because you're able to think differently. So a lot of this comes down to as a leader, instead of thinking the same thing that everybody else does or just going out and doing, 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 but to spend some time working on your business instead of in your business, to spend some time thinking and looking for new opportunities and ways that you can innovate, add value, and maximize your profit. So that's all I have today. Anybody else? Any questions or anything? Okay, Irene said, this is a lot to think about direction versus doing a short sell, doing a foreclosure, doing new construction, pre-owned, all over the place. Yes, there are many avenues out there. And of course, we can't do everything. So our goal is going to be to focus on a few things and do them really well. But what do we focus on? Well, the next few weeks, stay tuned. We're going to go through the process of how to find out what your customer needs are and how to address those customer needs innovatively and find out what's in the market, something that your, your competitors aren't yet aware of. So Janice says, different way of thinking. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Janice. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye and have a happy, wealthy, winning Wednesday. Woohoo! Bye.